Madam Speaker, Majority Leader Hoyer, Speaker Boehner, Congressman Lewis, Congressman Upton, all the serving members who are here, what do you say, don't you think we owe it to John? Let's be honest. One of the reasons none of us would have missed this is this is the only time in our entire lives in public service that we were in the same room with John Dingell and got the last word. <laughs> Don't you dare jump up and say that. <laughs> The, uh, this service has been very moving to me. Many of us had the chance to talk to John. I, we probably talked, I don't know, just a little over 24 hours before he passed away. And I was so grateful that his mind was clear and his spirit was strong. And his determination was, he said, you know, I'm not done yet. And he didn't know if he was gonna live an hour or a week or whatever. The idea was, <laughs> you ride the horse till the race is over. And all of us, particularly those of us who are not young, I hope we will remember that. He was a remarkable man, as all of you have said, a patriot in some cases without peer in the history of America. He spent more time in the Congress trying to fulfill the founders' admonition to form a more perfect union than anyone else. But he didn't just spend time there. One of the things that I was always amazed is he managed to find a way to have a good time. Hillary and I, and like many of you, we can remember almost every time we'd ever been with him and every casual conversation we had. I treasure those things. I've been in a duck blind with him when it was so cold, the ducks wouldn't come out. <laughs> and I told him he should look on the bright side. It saved us from a lot of criticism from the animal rights people. <laughs> I have been in his district campaigning for him and one of the rare examples when it looked like he might get less than 100% of the vote. I sat in the rotunda in the Capitol when he was honored by breaking the longest service record. Many of you have commented on how being his friend entitled getting your hide ripped off from time to time. You have to understand that's in part the mark of an honest friendship. If you think your friend is wrong, you tell him. And both of us have experienced this exquisite example of affection. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. He never snuck around behind your back. He didn't say one thing to your face and then call somebody to get a little press to do something else. John Dingle was a stand-up guy. He got up, he suited up, he played the game straight ahead. He was an old-fashioned man who did things in an old-fashioned way that we should adapt for new times. He fought like crazy, but he always asked himself at the end, okay, I'm not in the majority, or I am in the majority, 
Now what are we going to do? The thing I loved most about him was that he was a world-class doer. He understood that the trust he was given as a member of Congress representing his people was first and foremost a job. And the job required him to show up and do something for which he could give an accounting to the people who hired him and say, we did this, this, and this. We tried this, this, and this. I failed, so we did this, because this was still possible. He loved politics, but he also understood that not everyone would, dis would agree with him. And if you believe in the Constitution of the United States, that that was a good thing. It would give us a better, stronger country as long as we continue to see each other first as people. People first. And then figure out what we could do. I, I don't know if all of you have read his memoirs, but it, it's funny. He was so busy doing things, he didn't have time to write his memoirs till he was over 90. They were just published last December. And I was uh, looking through it again last night, and I thought, you know, he was afraid he was running out of time, so he sort of short-circuited the last 25 years of his life. He had so much to talk about. But there's one passage that sums up the book in a nutshell. And uh, out of deference to our presence in this historic holy place, and with all the clergy here, I think I will have to paraphrase some of the more <laughs> colorful language. He, he wrote, I served in the House for 59 years and 21 days. It remains the record for continuous service in the United States Congress, something that seems to impress a lot of people. I am not one of them. <laughs> Quite frankly, I don't care about records. Any fool can sit in the chair and take up space. It is what it is what you do with your time that matters. I look out over this crowd and I see so many of you that I had the honor to serve with. Members of both parties, I can tell you things we did together. John Dingell was just about the best doer in the history of American public life. Since 1955, that's a long time ago, until he left, he had a hand in just about every important contribution to following our <coughs> that followed our founders' admonition to form a more perfect union. And he was good about doing this when he was in the minority as well as when he was in the majority. I remember I, was, I pulled out the notes to make sure I, my memory was right. And it was, uh, in 1996, the Telecommunications Act was the first bill ever signed in the Library of Congress because we thought we were writing a positive communications manifesto the next several years. It was a highly complicated bill. The communications law had not been overhauled in 60 years. And John and many of our Democrats wanted to make sure that there was ample room for competition to keep the rates as low as possible and the service as wide as possible. And uh, he worked with Chairman Bliley, and he spoke that day in the Library of Congress as the minority leader of that committee because he was interested in getting something done. 
His long loyalty to health care is legendary, but in the end, what counts even more than his honoring his father was that he was there for Medicare and Medicaid. He was there for the Children's Health Insurance Program. He was there for the Affordable Care Act. And one of the things that I especially appreciated was his saying that his favorite job in public service was his summer job between his junior and senior year in college as a park ranger in Rocky Mountain National Park. For 59 years, he worked to be sure future generations could enjoy America's national treasure. As far as I know, he supported the efforts of every administration, Democrat and Republican, legislative or executive, to preserve that land. And then he became obsessed with public health. He supported President Nixon in the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Occupational Health and Safety Agency. He supported the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. I want to just say a couple of things about his record on civil rights. It is true that he endangered his seat in Congress by voting for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. His Polish immigrant Catholic heritage, his study of social justice with the Jesuits up the street, did not permit him to pull up the ladder of opportunity just because he had climbed it. And he was doing this a long time before the Civil Rights Bill was voted for. In his first term in Congress in 1956, he sponsored an anti-lynching bill, a fair housing bill, and a bill to eliminate the poll tax. As someone who grew up in a state where the poll tax was used to control the black vote, it meant a lot to me. But he became a particular hero of mine when I was only about 13 years old. In 1959, young Congressman Dingell stood before the fearsome speaker, Sam Rayburn, and objected to what is normally routine, the seating of all the new members at the same time. Because one of them was a congressman from my native state, Arkansas, who had defeated the sitting member for supporting the integration of Little Rock Central High School. And he beat him on a write-in campaign in which people were allowed to put printed stickers on the ballot, even though the law didn't provide for it. There were other interesting irregularities. <laughs> but the idea, it sounds simple, a little procedural bill, but I think it's very important, especially to the younger people here who may think of John Dinkle as yesterday's man. He was not afraid as a young man to risk the ire of people who could have wrecked his effectiveness to make the point that no one should gain automatic admission to the House if elected under a system that was not genuinely democratic. Finally, In 1961, I told Congressman Lewis this, John Dingell accepted uh, an invitation to go to the Union Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, to speak to the NAACP. It's a pretty good gig for a Polish kid from Michigan. <laughs> and the lady who was doing the dinner 
was trying to do a favor for a young lawyer she thought needed some help because he was making only $35 a week at the time, which wasn't much money even in 1961. So she let this young lawyer introduce John Dingle. And Vernon Jordan did a very good job of it. <laughs> and he called to tell me that to this very day, he was just another one of John's kids that his career really took off after he got to <laughs> introduce John Dingle. Until his last day on earth, John Dingle was doing. When his body wouldn't work anymore and his mind wouldn't stop, he turned to America's national obsession, tweeting, <laughs> and became a Zen master. <laughs> you should read, if you haven't, the collection of John's greatest Twitter hits. I mean, it's Zen mastery. Few words, much wisdom. And if you don't pay attention, you'll miss it. He honored the people who'd sent him to Congress for 59 years by keeping the sacred pact of doing and doing and doing. We give thanks for his long good life, but the real thing we have to do is to honor it now as he charged us in his last letter. He often quoted what I used to joke was his good friend, Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> who said after, after the Constitutional Convention, when asked what we had been left, he said, a republic if you can keep it. So now he has done all he could help us keep it. And the greatest honor we could ever give him is to spend whatever years we have left at the wheel to the last day. Goodbye, John. Finally, you are in that place of more perfect union where all God's children know how it feels to be free. Thank you.